The Redeem Team documentary set to release on October 7th on Netflix sparked this video creation. So I went back and looked at each Redeem Team member and all these NBA legends had a story to tell on Kobe Bryant and they all fit in. So here's the craziest Kobe Bryant Olympic story that you've ever heard. If you enjoy these types of videos, please help me out by hitting that like button, subscribe if you are new, get your popcorn, sit back and relax, and welcome to the craziest 2008 Dream Team Kobe Bryant story. Let's talk a little bit about the big picture for USA basketball. Last couple of Olympics that you were not a part of, maybe the reputation wasn't the greatest in the world. This is a different team, isn't it? It is a different team. I think it's a different attitude. I think it's, uh, yeah, we understand the, the significance and the importance of representing our country. And I, and I think that was something that was uh, maybe missing on those past teams. It was ugly to watch. It was terrible to be a part of. And he kicked our ass. I had a lot of concerns. That's why we recruited Kobe Bryant. A lot of it really you know, falls on me because you know I'm wiser of the guys having been around for so many years. Uh, so you know, most of the time, uh, I set the tone in practice. I'd like to share a lesson I learned from him. It was 2008. The Redeem team was formed, and we were in Vegas for the start of training camp, and we we're getting ready for the Olympics in Beijing. We're going to head to Beijing. And this is when I knew Kobe was a different monster, though. You hear about it. You hear about it. But you really, if you don't see it, you really, really don't know. So 2008 Olympics was right after he, um, he and the Lakers got beat by the Celtics. We, we were in the player lounge. Like playing cards. There was four of us playing spades. And, and he came in. And there was a little wine. Sat down, poured himself a glass. And he, like, saw this newspaper. And he saw a picture, it was like something about the Lakers series and blah, blah, blah. And it was a picture of Paul Pierce like celebrating. And there was a, a picture of Paul Pierce. So they had just lost to the Celtics in the finals, like tragically. And in a very, you know, gut-wrenching way. If you remember, they like blew a lead. It was not good. But Kobe Bryant sits down and pours a glass of wine. We're like, what the fuck, <laughs> you know? And he got very competitive with drinking the wine. And it was like, he didn't want to be behind anybody on these glasses. And we were like, Kobe, you know, we got practice tomorrow. We're just sipping. And I just remember watching <laughs> Kobe just stir the pot the whole time. You know how Kobe does. Yeah. Nope. He was like into this wine. He's, oh, I had, I've had three glasses. You've only had one. And I was like, that's because I'm small. And he literally like, he didn't say a word. He didn't say anything, but we saw him like take the paper. He started cutting out the Paul Pierce picture. You know, ripped out this picture. He like folded it up and he put it in his pocket and he was like, it's motivation for next year, but like dead ass serious. And we were like, okay, okay. And then he proceeded to like chug his wine, pour another glass, chug it, pour the third. And he was like, basically like, <laughs> he looks over and he's like, now I'm one ahead of you guys. We were like, okay. <laughs> And again, it was just this glimpse into like how he worked, how he functioned. I was like, oh, that's what, like, that's who he is. Like, that's what this is. Like, this is who Kobe Bryant is, you know? It was funny. We were in the Olympics, right? Yeah, when we uh, were starting to build a culture uh, at uh, USA Basketball, and he, Chauncey Billups, and Jason Kidd were added to add uh, veteran leadership. Coach K did a great job of, of, of preparing us, you know, of getting us ready. Coach K, I, I really want to say Coach K led the charge on that one because he, he knew the moment and how serious it was. You know, but at the same time, we had the group of guys we had, you didn't have to really worry about that, you know, with, with LeBron, with Kobe, with D-Wade. Carmelo and, you know, those, those guys who were great guys. Me and Cole became, we became very close. Um, the one that I'm closest to from the team. Yeah, I look at him as a brother. Bro, he pulled me to the side in the Olympics and said, you're a bad motherfucker. Mm. Like that, you know what I'm saying? Because he knew what it was already. So for me as a young player, four or five, you're four years in the league at that time, it's nothing, you want nothing more than somebody like that to come to the league. Like, you're a bad motherfucker, you know what I'm saying? That was respect. So when he did that, I knew it took a lot mm. out of him. Mm to tell me some shit like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I took that and then, you know, I, I built on that. And, um, you know, I, I thought the world of him prior to my experience with him, then playing with him, uh, even more so. You know, he just works extremely hard, competes. But we became close on some, like, 
some disrespectful shit. Like going at slick. your neck. He going at your neck. Slick. He saying shit to you, elbowing you. I had my braids back then too, so he touching my hair. I'm like, y'all don't like, what the fuck <laughs> like, yo, don't touch my hair. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, don't touch me no more, dog. The last summer, he was the butt of a lot of jokes. And he, you know, he, <laughs> he's, he's smirking and, you know, he's doing his little shit elbows. He come back, elbow me. I come back, elbow him. He's gonna be physical with you. He's gonna try to wear you down. He laughing, talking about that's all you got. You know what I'm saying? It was just pushing your button. Pushing my button to see if where I was, was gonna, at? where I was yeah. gonna stand at. I was just listening. I was just trying to soak everything up I could. You know, and I remember one thing that he said, he was like, if you wanna to try to be, you know, great at it, or wanna be one of the greats, you gotta put the work in. You know, there's no substitution to work. And so we get into a city, uh, one of the cities very late, and immediately we all go to the gym, you know? All my guys, it's, you know, it's Mello, it's B, it's Brian, it's Kobe. Like, we all go to the gym, we all get our work in. It's, re it's real late. And so after we get done getting our work in, me and my guys, we say, hey, like, let's meet for breakfast in the morning. And I wanted to establish myself as a young leader on the team by waking up bright and early. Like, if you can't sleep, whoever first one wake up, hit us up, we gonna go eat. Day one. So the goal was to be the first one at breakfast. And so we probably get like three hours of sleep. You can't sleep much when you're traveling across the world, you know, like we were traveling. So I set my alarm. I make sure I'm up by sunrise. I get out of bed. I put on my gear and I head downstairs. And we get probably get like three hours of sleep and we, we wake up, we go down to where the food is. And as we walk it down, you know, slubbing with, with sleep in our eyes, Kobe Bryant is sitting there. Kobe's already there with ice packs on his knees, drenched in sweat, right? So we walk up to Kobe, like, Kobe, what, what's up? And he was like, oh uh, yeah, man, I just finished, uh, finished the workout and uh, I'm about to go do another one. Now it took me a minute to figure it out, but this guy wasn't only awake before me, he had already worked out. And at that moment, I was like, wait, hold on. <laughs> we just worked out about three hours ago. You know what I mean? And like, you've done another workout and you about to go do another one? He was up every morning at seven o'clock in the morning, getting a lift in, going to the gym, getting up shots, going to get breakfast, coming back for practice by himself every day and then coming back at night to get shots up. He had just played in the finals days earlier. Meanwhile, I'd been off for months and I was still exhausted. What he had done that morning was incomprehensible to me. That dedication he had only days after falling short of an NBA championship. That taught me something I've never forgotten. Legends aren't defined by their successes. They're defined by how they bounce back from their failures. That's when I was like, okay, I gotta get my stuff together. I gotta get my shit together. Because this dude right here is on a whole different level uh, than even I'm on. And I'm supposed to be great, right? So. That's the kind of person he was. And that's how he drove me. You know what I mean? Like just little stuff like that. I went back and said, okay, that means I got to work hard and I got to do more. Uh, at the first week of training camp for the, for the Olympics in 08, he was doing it by himself. By the second week, we had the whole team there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's contagious. And that was our regiment from the second week of training camp to get ready for the Olympics all the way until we got the gold medal and we beat Spain and China. That was the standard he wanted to lead. He wanted to make sure that we all uh, achieved greatness. We put the work into it. You know, when you see, you know, at the time he was probably, you know, him and him and him and LeBron are the best players in the world, you know, arguably, you know, it's kind of one of those battles went back and forth at the time. So it was two different things that you had to worry about. With LeBron, it was pick and roll after pick and roll after pick and roll. With Kobe, it was a matter of don't let him get to a sweet spot. He's gonna beat you up for three quarters, and so in the fourth quarter, it'll be easier to get to his sweet spot. So spots. you need a crazy stamina. You see this man, the work he's putting in, the hours he's putting in the gym, the extra shots he's getting up, you can't help him. Like, you're not gonna go sit down on the sideline while he's still out here at 30. You know, see him doing that, and I'm, you know, I'm 20, 23 years old, you know. And I gotta get up there too, you know, and, and so it was great. It was great being able to work out with him. Um, to learn from him, to talk to him, to pick his brain about things, um, and then have a chance to compete with him. You're gonna see how hard he worked, how much he put into the game, how good he, how good he really is or was. And so to be able to play with a guy who had everything offensively, who could have just demanded us to give him the ball every time down, was worried about defense in the Olympics. Come on, bro. What, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna follow suit yeah. and the leader. 
And so that was one of my favorite things when he came to me and he said that, like, I didn't care about starting them all. I cared about was my moments when I got a chance to get on that court with Cole because I knew what it was going to go down. I'm sure he knew that, man, you know, I know D, this is tough for D-Wade not to be starting on this team. And mm -hmm. Cole came to me as he, he knew I was coming off the bench. He came to me right away and he eased my mind. He was like, listen. And he said, hey, D, when you get in, when you get in the game and it's me and you on the floor, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick up the defender 94 feet. I'm going to harass him. I'm going to turn him. I'm going to turn him. I'm going to turn him. And once I turn him, you do what you do. You come and like shoot at him, you know what I mean? Like to come and trap or to come and get a steal. <laughs> You know, and so I got so many steals and so many dunks and so much because of the unselfishness of a star in our lead. For me, I looked at that. I'm like, I'm a younger guy. I'm the, the least you know, accomplished guy in this group. I should be the one that you say. He should have told me, D, you go pressure and I'm going to do that. But his mindset wasn't that way. Grover, uh, his, his trainer was talking about how he would just go on bike rides through the desert and just like really just work, like just do wild stuff just to get like his mentally repaired. When Kobe was in uh, the Olympics in 2008. You took the uh, role in 08 as a defensive stopper. And then if they need you towards the end, you would go out and close, especially in 08 against Spain. Kobe right away said, I'll play defense. Hey! And in the first practice, he never took a shot. Hey, hey, hey. Take that call. Take that call. All Kobe cared about was defense. Uh, all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door. It's two days early, and it's Kobe. He said, Coach, can can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, certainly. So we went to a private room, and I, I said, w what do you need? He said, I, I, I need to ask you a favor. And I said, yeah, what, what is it? And he said, I want to guard the best perimeter player on every team that we play. Now, he's the NBA scoring champ. He's the best player in the league at that time. He wanted to let everyone know that I'm here and I want to guard the best offensive player every time. We go and we have a team meeting and the first practice, he doesn't take a shot. He does not take one shot. Mike successfully Coach K was a coach and he pulled Kobe and myself over and he said, So I call him over afterwards and I said, you know, yo, Kobe, you're actually gonna have open shots. Will you shoot the frickin' ball? <laughs> and Kobe said, I've been playing this game for I don't know how many years. I've never had an open shot. He goes, No, because with the talent that we have and the offense we're gonna run, you're gonna have open shots. So Kobe goes, Well, where gonna where are my open shots gonna be from? He said, mostly the corners. That's something that I really took the challenge of because very rarely did he take shots from the corner. And he smiled, you know, he had that smile. And he said from then on, I was the only coach ever to ask him to shoot. <laughs> and you know what he was doing, JJ? He, he had this vision of moments. He knew that for us to win the gold medal, we would have to beat Argentina, whether it be in a semis or the gold medal game and that he wanted to guard Ginobili. Uh, believe me, he already had that figured out and he was gonna prepare to guard Ginobili. It wasn't just to set an example for his team. He had that vision, crazy. So every single day from the moment the coach told him that, we would make 500, not miss, not take, we would make 500 hundred jump shots from the corners. That's it. Let's not just make the shot because there's a lot of individuals that can make the shot. Let's enhance the focus. This is how the ball has to go in the hoop. This is how it has to come back to you. So those 500 shots weren't all the same every single time. That's mindset. Man's the defending world champions. We're both undefeated and um this is the game everybody was waiting to see. Uh, is it your relationship with Paul? Your um, Paul's relationship? Well, we're like brothers. I mean, we're very, very close. And, and you know, I'm, I'm very happy for him that he's playing well. You know, I mean, and we're we're very, very tight. So it's, it's a little tough to compete against him. Right before the game, Paul well, we came to see me when they came to visit the village. I remember that very clearly and vividly. My big brother came to see me with my teammates, which everyone was like, whoa, Cody's in our apartment, how cool. And I believe, you know, the 
that might have been part of his strategy to kind of soften me up. Now it's time for the United States to battle what many feel is their toughest foe in these Olympic Games, Spain. Both teams come in 3-0. They're the two best teams. They're the two gold medal hopefuls. Bob said he gonna set the tone to start the game. And he said, if I'm running through Powell's fucking chest. First play of the game, I'm running through Paul Gasol. We was like, what? Man, you tripping. Man, that's your teammate. You tripping. You ain't about to do that. He said, first play of the game, I know what they're going to run. And he knew Powell's going to be the last screen. And he said, I'm running through that motherfucker. I swear, the first play of the game. We was like, holy shit. He just went right to the middle of my chest, trying to get right through me to send a message to not just to me, but to his teammates. And say, hey, this might be my brother. I play with him, we're close, but I don't care about anything else by winning. I'm right there in front of the men's like, bow! Yo! And he was just like, no, he ain't my teammate right now. Fucking get up. I'm like, I love this energy. This is what we need. <laughs> he was like, he did that to his teammate. Oh my God. We was like, oh, ain't no way. Ain't no way we losing this game. We about to beat the shit out of this man. So they look for me to really have that poise in those type of situations and not get rattled, not get flushed through about it. It is what it is. And so just to kind of keep that composure uh, was part of my job. And when he cut it to two points, you know, like three minutes to go, I was like, man, this is, <laughs> this is so much fun. You know, I remember wanting the ball in those situations. And once I made the shot, it just felt felt good. It was like, oh yeah, this is all right, I wanna do it again. It's a different it's a different feeling when playing for your country. When you're playing in the NBA, you're playing for um, a particular city, a particular market. When you're playing for your country, those lines go away. We're all together, we're all playing for the USA basketball. And, uh, it carries a, a great honor with it that, that, that goes above and beyond winning the NBA championship. That, that moment is very special. And I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please be sure to leave a like, subscribe if you are new, and comment down below what you thought about the stories in this video. I thought they were absolutely insane. Here are two new videos that you may enjoy, and I will catch you guys in the next one. Peace.